Oh, hi, Grade Sevens. It's Mr. Freiberg here again, and we are continuing to look at some algebra. Following on from our lesson yesterday, where we looked at some patterns in algebra and started to create some tables, I just want to look a little bit more at some of those uh, algebraic rules and also using some tables. So, if you've got the notes there, you'll be able to uh, follow through with uh, the PowerPoint presentation. If you are using your book, then your heading for today is rules and tables, and obviously you'd put down today's date, which is Tuesday the 28th of April. Remember at all, at any time, you can pause this video uh, if you need to uh, take something down off the screen which you haven't already got. So for instance, if I go on, there's the next slide with the learning intent. And as per usual, can we make sure that we have the learning intent written down in our books? Um, the learning intent for today is to record patterns and tables and represent using a rule. So like I said, very similar to yesterday, just sort of finishing that off and then using rules to find a term beyond the table. And the success criteria will be to actually use those rules and to do some substitution. I might actually do a proper lesson on substitution later this week. So probably for Friday, um, obviously you have some uh, maths online work to do as well. And uh, that's uh, probably, or it is also due by the end of the week. Okay, so a little bit of a review. Um, a couple of questions here about writing expressions, and this takes us back to the algebra lesson that you would have looked at in the first week. Uh, the one that we would have had as a live lesson on the Monday, but ended up being a uh, do-it-yourself sort of lesson on writing expressions. What I want you to do for the first question is we've got a bag of 12 marbles. In the bag are red, green, and blue marbles. And if I have a total of 12, represent that as an equation. And as a little clue there, state the variables. For example, let the number of red marbles equals R, let the number of green marbles be G, let the number of blue marbles be B, and then write an equation to represent the total number of marbles in the bag. I've also then got a number, uh, question number two here, which is about substitution. So solve the following expressions if X equals five and Y equals three. So replace X with five, wherever you see one, and replace y with three, wherever you see one, and come up with a numerical answer. I'll give you as much time as you need. Please pause the video and we'll come back and we'll check the answers uh, once you have uh, done them. So folks, there's the answers. All I needed you to do for the first one was just to write down that there's some number of red plus some number of green plus some number of blue. We don't know how many. So all we can do is write down the letters R, G, B, R plus G plus B, and that total equals 12. Let's take a look at number two with the substitution, though. This one's, uh, if you haven't seen substitution or you can't remember substitution, like I said, basically, wherever we see an X, we're going to replace it with a number five, and wherever we see a Y, we're going to replace it with a number three. So if we look at the first question, which says X plus Y, X plus Y, we're going to replace x with 5, we're going to replace y with 3, and so we've got 5 plus 3, and that equals 8. For the second one, we've got 3x plus 2y. Now this might take us back to something that you looked at uh, in that very first lesson. One of the little algebraic conventions is that in between that 3, whoops, in between that 3 and that x right there, there's actually a multiplication sign. Even though it's not written in there, there's a multiplication sign. So that's saying three times the X value. That's why I've got over here three times five. Plus two times the Y value. So plus two times three. You need to be very careful here how you type this into your calculator. Or you need to remember the order of operations. Or some people might know it as BOMDAS. I'm going to do the multiplication first before I do the addition. So I'm going to do 3 plus 5, which is 15. I'm going to do 2 plus 3, which is 6. Now I can add them together and I get 21. Very similar sort of uh, answer for part E. 4 times X, take away 3 times Y. You can check. Your answer is 11. If you got those right, well done. If you didn't quite get those ones right, 
then later this week, as I said, I'm going to run a lesson just on that sort of stuff there, which is called substitution. Okay, so you may uh, benefit greatly from looking at that video uh, later this week. All right, let's move on. Here's a little bit of an I do. So take a look at the screen as I run through some of these ideas. Now, this is about independent and dependent variables. That's something that's very, very important to understand in maths and particularly in algebra. Independent and dependent variables. If you look at those counters, I've just laid out some green counters. In the first one here, I've laid out in shape number one, let's call it shape number one, I've laid out three counters. There they are, one, two, three. In shape number two, I've added one more counter to the top, so now I've got four counters. And in shape number three, I've added another counter, so I've got five altogether. So I started with three, finished with five. If I wanted to draw that up in a little table, I've got two rows. The top row is going to be the shape number. So shape number one, shape number two, shape number three. And the second row will be the number of counters. So in shape number one, we had three counters and then four and then five. Notice that I have the shape number in the top row. So up there. And then I've got the number of counters in the bottom row. I've done that deliberately. When you are looking for an algebraic relationship, so in other words, when you're looking for an equation or a rule between two variables, you are trying to find how the x value affects the y value. So how these values up here affect that value down there. That's what we looked at during our last lesson. Now, in this case, the shape number, I'm going to call that the independent variable because it can be any number I want to be. All right, it could be shape number 100 for all I care. It is independent of anything. The number of counters, though, is the one that depends on how many shapes there are. So we call that the dependent variable. Because these numbers down here depend on what the shape number is. Now, boys and girls, that's what independent and dependent variables are. One variable depends on another. I'd like you, if I uh, clear the writing off this screen, I'd like you to write down the notes that you see on here. You might also like to write down the example up the top, just as a quick little example to show you what independent and dependent variables look like. But I'd also like you to write down these notes. I'm just going to clear the uh, drawings off here, and that might make it a little bit easier for you to read. There you go. Pause the video as you need so that you can make sure that you get all of those notes down. Okay, time for a question to do together on dependent and independent variables. If you go online and you buy some concert tickets, I know we went online, bought some Wiggles tickets for our little girl. The variables that are at play here are, and there are two of them, the variables are the amount of money that you pay and the number of tickets that you bought. The question is for you though, which one's the independent and which one's the dependent? So there's two variables, the number of tickets and the amount you paid. Which one relies on the other one? So in other words, which one's the dependent and then which one's the independent? Now you might like to write down that example and you might like to write down underneath it that the independent variable is whatever one you think it is and the dependent variable is whatever one you think it is. Pause the video, write the example down, and write down what you think is the independent, and write down what you think is the dependent variable. Okay, let's check. How did you go? The independent variable is the number of concert tickets you buy, because that doesn't rely on anything. I could go to the shop and choose to buy 100 concert tickets. The dependent variable, though, is the amount that I'm going to pay. Because if you think about it, if one of those Wiggles concert tickets is 
I'm going to pay $10 for one. But if I bought 10 of them, then the cost now changes to $100 because 10 times 10 is 100. And if I bought the 100 concert tickets, I'm going to pay $1,000. So you can see how the cost depends on how many concert tickets you buy. So that's why we say that the cost or the amount you pay is dependent and the number of tickets is independent. Let's take a look at this example. Here's an example about um, generating a table of values. And what we've got is we've got three rectangles up the top of the page. They're from a family of rectangles that have a constant height. So that's going to be a little tricky bit in there to get understanding of. They're constant height of three centimetres, but their base length changes. So take a look at this first rectangle here. The height's three and the base is 1.4. The second rectangle has a height of three and a base of 2.6. The third one has a height of three and a base of 5.1. So the base length changes. Here's an important point to note. And if you've got the notes, you might like to highlight this. The area of the rectangle depends on that base length. So the area inside here depends on how big that base length is. And if you think about it, the longer this base length, the bigger the area. So the dependent variable is the area of the rectangle. By the way, if you've got the notes, you should be able to write that in there. If you're just using your maths book, I'll give you some time at the end to pause this and you'll be able to write uh, your, or you'll be able to write down what you see on the slide in your book. The independent variable is the base length because that changes of its own free will. So the base length of the rectangle is the thing that changes. We then have some calculations to make. It says fill in the table below. So if we use area of a rectangle equals length times width, remember that width doesn't change. The width is always three. But the length is changing. So for instance, for the first one, we're going to go 1.4 times three. And you can check on your calculator that 1.4 times three gives you an area of 4.2. If I now put the base length to be 2.6, I multiply 2.6 times 3, and you might have beaten me to it, 7.8. And then you guessed at the last one, I'm going to do 5.1 times 3, and again you might beat me to it, 15.3. So the area of those rectangles depends on the base length. Some of the others, if you want to consider it, if you've got a base length of 3, 1 times 3 is 3, 2 times 3 is 6, 3 times 3 is 9, just using length times width. Now, if you've got the class notes there, you might like to pause the video and just make sure that you've got all this down. If you are writing in your book, I'll give you some time. Uh, if you pause the video, you'll be able to to write down what you see on the screen and write it down in your book because it's all pretty important stuff. Okay, so let's just uh, continue. If we uh, rewrite the table that we had on the previous slide, so 4.2, 7.8, 5.1, Let's see if we can now come up with an equation that models this family of rectangles. Now, you might remember what we did in our last lesson is we found a relationship between the top row and the bottom row, but we did it in a particular manner. Now, I'm actually going to go back to the previous slide because that's where the important information is. And the important information is actually down here in this bottom table. Now, you might remember from our last lesson, our live lesson, we looked at what is the additive relationship 
between these y values down the bottom. What are these numbers going up by? They're increasing every time by 3. 3 plus 3 equals 6. 6 plus 3 equals 9. That additive relationship is actually the same as the multiplicative relationship between the two variables. So I reckon that the x value or the length multiplied by 3 is going to get me the area. Well, it works for this table. Think about what we did up here. I multiplied all those base lengths by 3. So if I go back to that last slide, write an algebraic equation that models this family of rectangles. The area, which is equal to the y value, is going to equal the x value multiplied by 3. The nice way to write it would be y equals 3x. So that's our equation. Take a moment if you need to pause, go over what we've done again, and I'll meet you on the next slide when you're ready. All right, on this next slide, it's your turn. I want you to actually try this one yourself. So if you've got the notes, this slide here is with the blanks, and you might like to spend some time now to fill those blanks in and see if you can actually work the solution out yourself. Remember, the solution, if you look at the screen, is to do the same thing that we did on the previous slide, and that is come up with an equation. For this particular question, we've got a scone recipe. It uses two cups of self-raising flour to make 12 scones. The number of scones you make depends on the amount of flour you have. So there's a really big clue right there. I want you to see if you can identify what the independent, what the dependent variables are, and then I want you to see if you can fill in this table. There's another clue there. Two cups of self-raising flour and how many scones they make. I want you then to come up, uh, see if you can come up with the equation all the way at the end. Again, I'll pause the video. If you've got the notes, you can write your answer in the notes. Otherwise, write all of that that you see on the screen in your book and I'll meet you with the answers when you're ready. Okay, let's check. Now, it says up here that the number of scones you make depends on the amount of flour. So the number of scones is the dependent variable, and the amount of flour is the independent variable. If you think about it, the more flour you put in, the more scones you're going to have. So the scones depends on the flour. If I look at the first sentence, it tells me that for two cups of flour, I'm going to be able to make 12 scones. Now, simple mathematics tells me that if I want to make half a batch, so uh, one flour of scones, one cup of flour, I should say, is going to make six scones. And then the other way, you'll notice that these are now going up by a certain amount. They go up by six. So for three cups, 12 plus another six means I'm going to make 18 scones. If you can identify that plus six, that additive relationship, then I reckon you've just nutted out the equation because that additive relationship is the same as the multiplicative relationship between the two variables. And so if you've written down an equation that looks like y equals x multiplied by 6, or better still, y equals 6x, then well done. You've been able to identify that equation. Pause the video if you need to check your answer or get something off that. That's going to be it for this lesson, boys and girls, because on the next slide, it's now going to give you some textbook work. So this time we're in section 5.3, which is all about using rules. And these questions are similar to those ones that you've just done. Pages 274 to 277. If you're at school, you can use your textbook. If you're not, over the next few slides, we've got those questions. You can also find the questions in the class notes. And there's also the textbook document that's on uh, the eLearn classroom. As it says there, ensure you uh, complete these questions and then scan or photograph a copy of your work and send it to me. 
questions I want you to do out of 5.3 are questions 2, 5, 7 and 10. And if you're up for a challenge, you can also try questions 12 and 13 as some extension work. So there they are. There's question 2, 5 and 7 on the left hand side. And then I've also got question 10 on the top of the right hand side. The last two questions there, 12 and 13, there for extension. So what you're doing is you're completing some tables of values, you're rewriting some algebra, and then you're actually creating um, tables and finding rules in say question seven, in question 10, and then question 13, oh, sorry, question 12. Before you finish, I'd also like you to write down some definitions. You can write these in the back of your book or you can write your, uh, write your answers just in your maths book. But what I'd like you to do is to write down um, your definitions for variable, pronumeral and term. And also write down for me what you know the difference is between an expression and an equation. And you can check your answers when you're done. So what have we done today? We have used rules to find out term values beyond a table. And we've also substituted to, uh, into a given expression. Folks, that's it for our lesson today. Thank you very much again for your time and patience. Um, thank you for those people who have sent me their homework and their classwork completed from the live lesson. And I look forward to uh, being in your ears again for the last lesson this week, which again is looking at algebra, but specifically looking at some substitution. Thanks everyone. Have a lovely day.